Hello everyone and welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. I hope you guys are all doing well and are ready to learn, so let's get started. First thing I said we need to do when we start analyzing these four systems is we have to do something called a free body diagram. This can be very important and this is basically a drawing of our situation which allows us to solve for the forces inside of a structure. Now free body diagrams they sound pretty crazy but they're actually very simple. It is a sketch of a body or parts of a body that have been removed from its surroundings. And that removed from its surroundings is actually going to be very important as I will show you. Now, free body diagrams actually include two things. So when you guys are drawing them in exams or assignments, remember that professors are gonna be looking for two things. The first one is that the free body diagram contains all the forces acting on the body. So this will include weight, support reactions, applied forces, and even though I don't list it, it's gonna also include things like internal forces, which we will discuss later. So that's gonna be the first thing. Make sure you throw all your forces on this free body diagram. The second thing is it has to have all relevant dimensions. So that would include things like lengths, as well as things like angles. The goal of the free body diagram, and this is how you get top marks. I know you guys all want the secrets to getting those top marks. The, the goal to getting top marks is that for your free body diagram, you should be able to solve the question directly with your free body diagram. You shouldn't have to draw your free body diagram and then keep referring back to the original figure. You should have your free body diagram and that should be all you need to solve the question. Now you guys may be thinking, all right, Clayton, well, doesn't sound too bad. Can you give me an example? Well, of course I can. Let's say that we have this little crane structure and for some particular reason, I don't know why, maybe I'm just bored. I want to analyze this particular piece of the crane structure. So this is where that first part of the free body diagram comes in, where I say we remove it from its surroundings. On the left hand side, we have the entire crane, but I'm just focusing in on a little piece of that crane. Now, the first thing to do is to label all the forces on the body. And this is where things might get a little bit confusing for students. Some are obvious, but some are not so obvious. So if we look at the crane, it's holding up a big weight. Well, we know that weight is simply mass times gravity. So we know on that rope, there's going to be a force pulling the crane downwards, which is simply the mass of that weight multiplied by gravity. That's a simple one. Most of you guys are thinking, Clayton, ah, this is a piece of cake. Now, where it's going to become new for a lot of students is this idea right here. If our free body diagram cuts any sort of member, we have to replace that member with forces. Now you guys are just saying, oh, hold on, Clayton, what? What did you say? Well, if we look at our free body diagram on the left side, we can see that we actually cut through two of the members. I circled them with purple there. Now, when we cut through these members, we actually have to replace it with its internal forces. And the internal forces produced are going to vary depending on what kind of member we have. For this particular lecture, and we're going to talk a bit about it, we're going to talk more about it later, we're dealing with truss members and they're the simplest form. If we cut through a truss member, we simply replace it with an axial load that's pointed away from our member. So as we can see here, we cut through two of the members, but for each member, we just replaced it with a single force and it, we say that it's directed away. Now, it doesn't always have to be directed away, so that's something to keep in mind, but we're gonna talk more about that later. Now, this is the first thing where students start to make mistakes is when I mark exams, this is the most common free body diagram I see. It has all the forces, which is great, but it doesn't have all the dimensions. So for this to be a complete free body diagram, we're gonna to have to include dimensions. So I would do things like the length of the crane, as well as the angle the crane makes, something like that. You want to have it as complete as possible. Now, let's do a different example. Let's say that we want to analyze uh, the bottom of this crane. Well, the first thing that we know is we cut through two of the members, just like before. So we're gonna to have to replace those with axial forces. A second thing that we're gonna talk about a little bit later in this video is the crane has to be supported. If the crane's not supported, well, it's just going to fall over. So the crane actually has something called reaction forces, which are going to be at the base of the crane. So I would call these R1 and R2. Now there's gonna be a bunch of different type of reaction forces depending on the support conditions. As we're going to see, there's gonna be three different support conditions that we deal with in this class, but they're actually really simple, so you guys don't have to worry too much. Now, the last thing that we have to do, of course, is give it some dimensions. After that, the crane's looking pretty sexy, or I guess the free body diagram's looking pretty sexy. 
Last thing that we are going to discuss in this is which way do these forces go? Remember I said that for these truss elements, they have an axial load. But we know that members can either be in tension or compression. So if we were to label it pointing away, we are assuming that the member there is actually in tension. But is it actually in tension? Well, that's something we need to discuss. So let's go to something what we call sign convention. Now, for axial members or these truss members, we always assume that, assume that the force points away from the object. So that's going to be the key here. In all those free body diagrams, we assume that our force is pointing away. This means that we are going to assume that the member is in tension. And I keep saying assume because it's an assumption. Now, I know you guys are going to say, ha, Clayton, you know what they say about assumptions. Yeah, yeah, I know, but don't worry. This one's kind of mathematically based. So let's talk about what it means to be in tension. Well, tension, we say something is in tension if it makes our body longer. All right, so let's say that we have our nice body. We put two tensile forces on it. We expect that this is going to start expanding. So the second thing, of course, is compression. So tension makes the body longer. Compression, as you guys may guess, it's going to start compressing the body. So let's say that this is our original body. After we compress it, it's going to shrink down to something like this. Again, very trivial, but now you guys have a good understanding of tension or compression. Now, the reason why we assume tension is this. When we do all of our calculations, the math is actually going to be on our side. Now, this very rarely happens. Remember, math usually doesn't like us, but in this case, it wants to be friendly, which is great for us. So when we do our calculations and we assume tension, if we solve our member and we get that it's positive, it means that it actually is in tension, which is great. So every time you see a positive answer, it means tension. Now, if we do all of our calculations, and our answer is actually negative, well, that actually means it's in compression. So every time we get a positive answer, it means tension. Every time we get a negative answer, it means it's in compression. So it's a very common sign convention and allows us to very easily determine whether something's in tension or it's in compression. Now, I have to make one note here because I may have scared a lot of students when I talked about making a body longer or making a body shorter. One thing that we're dealing with in this course is the idea of something called rigid bodies, which means that things actually do not deform. Even though I showed things deforming, they actually don't deform in reality, or the deformation is actually very, very tiny. Now, the last thing that we're going to talk about before we get into the, the tricks are support conditions. As I said, we need support conditions on things or else they're just going to fly away. The majority of the problems that we deal with, we're going to be applying external loads, which we know, and the goal is going to be solving for those support reactions, knowing that the resultant force must be equal to zero. But the question is, what are these support reactions or support conditions? There's going to be three major ones that we're going to talk about. The first one is called pins. Now, pins are going to be perhaps the most common, and they're generally represented by a triangle. Now this is nice because pins provide two things. One is horizontal restriction and the other one is vertical restriction. So this stops our object from moving in both the horizontal direction as well as the vertical direction. But it does not stop any sort of rotation. So this is going to be the key here. It provides good horizontal restriction as well as vertical restriction, but it does not stop any sort of rotation. Now how would we model this with forces? Well, it's very simple. If we're providing horizontal and vertical restriction, we have two forces to kind of counteract that. So every time I see a pin, I can replace it with two forces. One is going to be a vertical force to restrict any vertical movement. And the second one is going to be a horizontal force to restrict any horizontal movement. Now, a more simple version of a pin is what we call a roller. Now, these are generally represented with a circle. But sometimes, and I have to kind of make a disclaimer here, sometimes you guys will see a triangle with little circles underneath. If you guys see those little circles, it's definitely going to be a roller. Now rollers provide only one restriction, all right? So it provides only horizontal or vertical restriction. The question is, which way does it restrict? Well, the way it actually restricts is based upon the ground the roller is set on. So in this particular case, since my ground is flat, I'm providing vertical restriction. So I would say that the reaction force is something like Ry. But if my ground was inclined something like this, well, the reaction force is going to incline with it. So the reaction force is always going to be perpendicular to the ground. 
But nevertheless, as we can see, we're only providing restriction in one direction. Pins, two directions. Rollers, one direction. Now, the question becomes, what is the third type? Well, the third type is going to be something called fixed condition. Now, fixed condition provides both the restrictions that a pin does, so it restricts it from both horizontal translation as well as vertical translation, but it also stops rotation. So what kind of forces would this look like? Well, it's going to, of course, have the same ones as a pin because it's providing that horizontal and vertical restriction. So I'm going to have a horizontal force and a vertical force, but it's also going to provide something called a reaction moment. Now, don't be scared. Moments are something we haven't seen before, but we're going to be talking about them next week. So something we haven't seen, but we'll be talking about it next week. So it's, it's nothing to be scared about. And that moment is actually what counteracts any sort of rotation. Now you guys are saying, all right, Clayton, it doesn't look too bad. Can I have an example? Well, of course you can. So let's say that we have our beam and we apply two external loads on the beam. Now again, these external loads are gonna be something we typically know, all right? So P1, P2 is something you're typically going to be given in the question. And the goal of the question is going to say, what are the support conditions at both A and B? Well, this is going to be simple because what we're going to do is we're going to take our beam, we're going to apply all our loads, and we're going to convert all of those support conditions into equivalent loads. So if we look at the left-hand side, we have a pin. Now we know that a pin provides two support conditions, AX as well as AY, so a vertical and a horizontal force. Now if we look at B, it's a circle, which means it's a roller, and it's only going to provide that vertical condition. So a very common problem you guys will see, and this will be more later on, is we now know what P1 and P2 are. How do we solve for those support conditions? So AX, AY, as well as BY. Again, this is something we're going to tackle a little bit later, but this is just showing you guys what we use these support conditions for. Now you guys may be saying, all right, Clayton, support conditions, that's a piece of cake. If I have some sort of scenario where I have a pin or a fixed connection in my free body diagram, I know which forces to put on that free body diagram. Everything's pretty good. Problems start to occur in what I call special members. Now, <laughs> it's, it's not a good type of special. It's a bad type of special because these are where students start having problems in these special members because if they give you these special members, they follow a unique set of rules. And if you guys don't know these rules, chances are you're not going to be able to solve the question. In the next video, we're going to be discussing something called particle equilibrium. Now, in particle equilibrium, we have two equations. And two equations means that we can solve for two unknowns. So every problem that we have in the, in the next following example, there should only be two unknowns. With these special cases, it gives professors the ability to add three unknowns. And most students will say, I have two equations, three unknowns, I don't know what to do. But we have to remember these special members because these allow us to take it from three unknowns back down to two unknowns. So the first one is something called a pulley. So a pulley, assuming frictionless, only change the direction of a force and not the magnitude. So let's say that I have a pulley here. And as we can see in purple, we have two ropes. So we know that we're going to have two forces on both sides. Most students will look at this and say, oh, Clayton, I have two forces in this pulley that I need to figure out. But we have to remember that pulleys only change the direction of a force and not the magnitude. This means if that left hand side was equal to P, well, the right hand side must also equal P. So in pulley cases, even though there's two forces present on the pulley, the forces are the exact same. So there's only one unknown. So that's going to be the first trick, pulleys. The second one is a more obvious trick, which is cable, ropes, and wires. So remember before we said that if we calculate things and we get a positive answer, it means it's in tension. And if we calculate and get a negative answer, it means it's in compression. Well, if we're ever dealing with a rope, wire, or cable, these will always be in tension. The idea of ropes, cables, and wires, they're only for tension. So if you guys have a case where you're calculating the forces in a rope or a wire and you guys get it to be negative, well, something's wrong because they should always be in tension. So that's kind of a more simple one. And again, it's very easy to show. You just take a wire, try putting it in compression. You're, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> Let's be honest. Now, the third case, and this is by far the most hated case, and that is springs. All right, springs, springs are always the worst. So the force in a spring can actually be determined using a separate formula. Remember when I said that next week or next video, we're going to discuss how to solve for these forces 
and we have two equations, which means we can solve for two unknowns. Well, if we have a spring, it's going to introduce a third unknown. And we have to keep in mind that for springs, they actually have their own separate equation to solve for the forces in these springs. And that is this, where the force in the spring is equal to k times delta x. Now, in this particular case, or I guess all cases for <laughs> I'm thinking ahead to graduate courses. As you guys are going to see, this won't always be the case, but for this course, it'll always be the case because it's linear elastic. K is going to be the spring constant. So it's going to be a constant value and it's going to have units of force per distance. Now this delta X, this is going to be the change in length of the spring. So it's not going to be the current length. It's not going to be the initial length, but that change in length. That's why I have the formula as L, which is its current deformed length, minus its initial or undeformed length. So this is very simple. So in a spring case, you're going to have three unknowns. And again, that's where all students freak out because remember, we can only solve for two unknowns. But you guys say, oh wait, I got a special formula for springs, which allows me to solve for the force in the spring. So once I know that force, I go back down to two unknowns. I got my two equations. I'm good to go. So those are going to be the special members to consider. But yeah, that's it for this video. Again, I hope it was more fun than the last video because now we're actually taking what we learned in the first two weeks and are now applying it to actual engineering applications, which are great. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't see any applications. And you're right, this video didn't show them the best, but next video, once we discuss equilibrium, it'll become much more apparent. All right, so that's gonna be it for this video. Thank you guys so much for listening. I will see you guys in the next video.